and to meet you, whether you know some folks are online, not only about this, but there's some online watching us here too. Too. So for those who couldn't actually make it out to, to, the, to the center this evening, you're welcome. I welcome you all. Now, yeah, you know, taking over any organization is a, a task within itself. Taking over a political party and providing leadership of uh, that party is also, um, you know, I would be honest to say it's a challenge. And it's one that I am up for. It is one that, that I am I'm proud to have been, uh, to have been given. Um, and it's a real opportunity. Um, and I think it's an opportunity for the party. It's an opportunity for the party to, it's an opportunity for the party to, to be able to position itself for the future. And it's, you know, that, there, there's no mistake to the theme um, of today, new politics ready for the future. And in so many ways, that, that's what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the future and, and how we position ourselves for that future and what that new politics is. So when I, when I talk about new politics, and that's where we start this conversation, and I, and it, I want it to be a conversation. I want it to be a conversation with those at home. I want it to be a conversation with those here in the UK watching our life. I want it to be a conversation with those here in the room. So when I talk about new politics, what am I talking about? I've talked about it uh, in previous campaigns there. I've talked about it since my election. And really, what I'm talking about is creating opportunities. New politics at its core is about facilitating and creating opportunities so that you can be the best of who you are. It is not about the government directing or telling you what and how to be the best, but it's to provide opportunities. So often, that is what is lacking, not only in the spaces here in the diaspora, but home in Barbados, there are no opportunities. It's not that we don't have the talent, it's not that we don't have the time, it's not that we don't have the facilities, but it's about how you create what I call what makes of opportunities? How do you go about creating chances for our young people to be able to be excellent? You know, recently after the, the past, George uh, Lamy, and, and he talks a lot about the concept we like to call being civilization. And I think part of creating those opportunities and fulfilling who we are is to recognize as a people that we are a Caribbean civilization. So often we individualize ourselves, and, and I'm probably speaking more than to the diaspora here now. We individualize ourselves with Dominican, Barbadian, St. Lucian, St. Benson, Vietnamese, and go down the line without recognizing the collective power that we hold, the collective will of what I will call Caribbean civilization. A few weeks ago, I was in Leicester for the inauguration of the first Black Lord Mayor of Leicester. And this is not the first black world in 100 years or 200 years. We're talking about All of that is part of it. It's about recognizing our identity and recognizing the power of that civilization. And then the question is, what do we do with it? Because it's not just lip service that we're going to talk about. Oh, you know, we have this wonderful, great Caribbean civilization. We always bring off the things that we give into the world. For kids, universities of the West Indies, scientists, lawyers, jurists, doctors, and we go down the line and we can list the, 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 the great um, Caribbean athletes and musicians and we can count them off. But I don't think sometimes we see the collective force of who we are and what that brings to bear on humanity. 
And that, that calls for acknowledging ourselves and outsizing ourselves. Not, not seeing these individual nations, but recognizing it as a collective, we can imagine ourselves to be bigger than these small spaces that we are to contain ourselves. And to understand that as a people, we shall not be contained. We will not be chained, we will not be boxed in. We are a people. We have a voice, we have a purpose. And then how do you translate that into creative opportunities? What does it mean for a Caribbean, this Caribbean civilization, the diaspora, connecting to the spaces at home, in Barbados, Jamaica? What does that mean for a collective will? And how do we bring that to bear on the politics locally, the politics here, and the politics globally to solve the solutions? Because if you realize what I'm talking about, it's not just a concept. It's something that we have to activate because we are facing lots of problems in the Caribbean. Climate change, debt, uh, crime, cost of living, all of these are problems that require not only local action, they require regional action, and they require spaces and people in cities like this to bring to bear on us in the Caribbean and to the advocates. Because that's what we ask for. That's what you are. You are part of the advocates of this Caribbean civilization, representing it wherever you are and pressing the case for the things that we require um, in the Caribbean. And the flip side of that is that you exist here because that Caribbean civilization exists here. That, you know, if, if those countries are swallowed up, you know, God forbid, by waves and water, the actual physical space that we call our home, that in all of us here in, uh, and all of you here in the diaspora. So we need advocates. That's why there's a practical application to this. We need you to advocate in your spaces. So then George Cole became the first Afro-Caribbean or we are blessed, that's an advocate. When we have uh, the consular here, that's an advocate because that is what is required to bring the pressure and the changes to bear. Because otherwise, we don't get changed. We'll go to one conference, we'll go to a summit, somebody will say, you know, the Caribbean is on the threat, everyone's gonna fly, yes, small islands are having a hard time. But what does that mean in individual spaces that you are in to be able to help us in the Caribbean and vice versa? Because you, you're, you're, there's that psychological, um, magical link, if you like, between yourselves here, that you are sustained by the fact that these countries exist in the Caribbean. They give you life, they give these places life, the contributions of Caribbean and Caribbean folk to the Britain and the US and wherever they are has been great. It is, it is definitely outsized by the actual number of who we are and the percentage of who we are. And we have to start to advocate and recognize our space as a civilization. We have given to humanity and we demand that our voices be heard. We demand that our presence be respected. And we don't have to beg for a place at the table. You know why? Because we made that table and we already have a seat. We have to start taking ownership. Often, you know, we strip from ourselves and we stay in our little spaces and we talk about, oh, that's not my name. Of course it's your name. It's our name. Global affairs are our name. We have made this world. We have made this world. We contributed to all of these things that we stay around. And it's time that we take ownership of them. You now, really, the collective of what the Caribbean is, uh, you know, we, we are probably, I think it's about the sixth or seventh largest trading partner with the USA, for example. How do we, how do we bring that to bear in our collective relationship with America? What we don't. When we think about, you know, our, our space and what we contribute, and what we contributed to the NF, NHS here in the UK, uh, what we contributed to the to to London Tube, to the teaching service here. How are we bringing that collective voices to bear to say, you know what, there are problems in the Caribbean that require your attention, UK. There are problems in the Caribbean that require your attention, USA. And they're not because we, we're not doing our best or we can't, we can't make our own way in the world. It's not that. It is just that some of these problems we need to create. And we're trying to solve them, whether it's our debt problems, sometimes whether it's our, 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 our climate change issues. And some of these problems, we are not the biggest contributors to them, but the effects of them are necessarily the greatest. So when I talk about new politics, I want us to recognize our civilization, recognize who we are, and in terms of create opportunities and create advocates in these spaces for Caribbean people and for the cause of Caribbean. Because that, that's very important. You are the advocates not only for our
Barbados and Trinidad and all the individual countries, but you are the advocate for the Caribbean. So this is not necessarily only about the Democratic Party or Saturday Party, other than the president of the Democratic Party. We are uh, we're basically not to recognize the value of that institution or what it's contributed to Caribbean development, but the cause has to also embrace more than that. It has to be bigger than ourselves. We have to believe that we are bigger than ourselves. Imagine how our contribution is going. You know, so that, that's one element of new politics. The other, the other element of new politics that we have to recognize is that we have to start to create opportunities for our young people in the now. You know, the, the, the theme of this is about the future, ready for the future. But we can't be ready for the future if we're not taking care of the now. So many of our young people are left behind and they're not provided with relevant opportunities so that they can become the best of who they are. And if, and if we want to be ready for the future, we have to start acting in the now. The future doesn't take care of itself. I know some days in, in, our, in our culture, in our culture, we want to say, the future can take care of itself. It doesn't. We build the future. You know, the future that that, that you have built here didn't happen by accident. The creation of greatness of Caribbean people in the UK, that was an accident though. You were building for the future, but you had to do it in your space at that particular moment in time. And in order for us to kind of do that, we have to create opportunities for our young people in the Caribbean. We have to create opportunities that keeps them in the Caribbean. Whether it's educational, whether it's work, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's investment, arts and crafts, whether it's creative enterprises, whatever, we have to create opportunities for the next generation of Caribbean people. Because at the moment, that is part of the problem we're tackling. There is a lack of opportunities for our people to be able to grow in the spaces that they are. But that's also where the diaspora comes in. Because the diaspora, I've made this argument before, I know some people are. Uh, I didn't necessarily understand it. Some of the pundits and the radio show hosts did not get it. Um, and that's very, very sad. I think that's a reflection on them. I've made this argument before and I'll make it again. I think there is a, a, a real conversation that we need to have about how the diaspora in Barbados and from Barbados, and I'll make very sense the rest of the Caribbean, how the diaspora contributes and participates in our, in our government systems, in our local systems. Too often we see you guys as automatic telling machines. You know, if there's a hurricane, if there's a hospital issue, that's for send this money. And you regularly do these things. But we have to stop taking you for granted. You are not just an ATM to give us money. And I think we need to, that relationship needs to improve. There has to be more of an understanding that the diaspora has its voice in terms of, of its space. Yes, you're not always physically living there, but your views and your voices should be heard. We're not saying that those views and those voices should outsize the person living there. That, that, would, that would be a, an equal relationship, but we're saying there has to be a proper space created for the diaspora to have engagement in the countries that you are literally contributing to. Remittances in the Caribbean are in the millions, up to the billions. We know this all across the region. Some families are only sustained because of remittances. They only eat because their families here send borrows, money, whatever it is. We know this is a fact. This is not made up stories. So therefore, how are we shutting out the voices of persons who are literally sustaining the existence of large pockets of our populations back home? It is not right and it has to end. We need to start the serious conversations. We're intelligent enough that we can design a formula to have diaspora and persons of diaspora feed into our systems before outweighing the fact that we're not living there uh, and your numbers actually here may be greater than the person living on them. We are clever enough to be able to do this. There are examples across the country. Italy, for example, folks in London elect one representative from the Italian London representative, if you like, to go and sit in the, um, in the parliamentary um, uh, 
founder of Yesenia Eaton. And that person then takes the views of the diaspora living in London. Those are, those are some of the innovative things that we can think about. We're not talking about election of, of, of that you're going to be able to vote in your, your, your previous constituencies that you're registered. Obviously, that can create imbalances. But the idea that, you know, why is it not, uh, for example, one of the senators could be a senator from the diaspora? And that person would, would be able to have a voice and a contribution. There's nothing wrong with that. That's sensible, logical policy. And we have to have these serious conversations because my view is this simple. If we are taking your money, we take your time, we want you, I've just told you, I want you to be advocates for the Caribbean civilization. I want you to be advocates to help us solve and help me solve the problems that we're facing at home. It is only right that there is some form of a seat at the table in the countries that you're coming. That, that can only be right. We're not saying that you're going to have an, an outside um, space in terms of your numbers because you have to keep everything balanced, but there has to be some facilitation and consideration. And we are clever enough that we can design this. Okay? I, don't, I don't see this as anything to be afraid of or, or you know, it, 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 it's something, it's a mixed step in our logical progress. We talk about we're a new republic, we want to talk about new democracy, new politics. These are the things we have to get serious about because if we're asking you to be our advocates, well then our advocates here need to be feeding back into our systems there. Because when you're out here fighting for issues or calling your local MP so that when they go to parliament, they're going to fight on the parliament for reparations. They're going to bring climate change to the UK floor. They're going to say, you know what, there needs to be some form of debt cancellation going on for the Caribbean. Uh, they're going to bring the issues and say, you know what, y'all need to look at the uh, issues of banking, issues in the length of the Caribbean. Show that your local MPs start fighting in Parliament because you are a constituent here. You have power, but that power also will enable us to be having power as well. So it's that relationship. So if you're going to ask that, it has to be so, so we understand the, 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 the new politics as creating a serious democracy that is based on engagement, that is based on having everyone, all Barbadians. And when I say all, I mean all. It does not matter. Black, white, Indian, male, female, Barbadianism at home, Barbadianism in the diaspora, having all engaged and fully participated in our democracy so that we get the best of them. And we create opportunities for them to engage opportunities, real opportunities for them to invest in Barbados, uh, real opportunities for them to help grow our society in terms of not only, uh, as I said, we have to stop using the ATM machine, not only in the investments, but help to understand and feed back into our policy. Their experiences and networks over here, that you can bring to bear as we go through a lot of our problems. Uh, you know, right now we're gonna be looking at the redesign of our educational system. Here, there are Caribbean experts in the diaspora that can feed me and say, you know what? Here, they tried that with the school thing, or they tried grammar schools, or they tried academies. It didn't work like this. Culturally, yes, it made differences, but we can help you with whatever models. All of these are things that we have to get serious about. Now, I know you guys have probably heard this conversation for so long about having the diaspora as part of the Caribbean, but there's no real materialization of it. The relationship always seems lopsided, it always seems one way. It's about taking for diaspora, but not recognizing the value of what you are. And I want to argue that there is a new position for you beyond the, the, the remittances, beyond the donations to the hospital. You can become our advocates. But in order for you to become our advocates, there has to be a social contract between you and your country you also have some form of space at the, at the table in terms of shaping the outlook of that country. Um, mm -hmm. not, as I said, I'm going to say to all the pundits who are listening for, 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 for something, it is not an outsized relationship. As I said, you're not asking you take up the whole table, but you're asking for a little corner, your own deserved corner. Because it's one thing to, to not and have to fight for your space in these societies where sometimes you're marginal and you're minority. It's quite another to have your own country 
in some ways treating you in that same way. So you're trapped between the two spaces and maybe, you know, to, to invoke the memory of black men, you're in the castle of your skin. You know, and, 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 and we need to stop that. There's so much that we have to work on in terms of who we are. And that's why I want to go back to this point that to believe we are a Caribbean civilization. We are a people, we are people of excellence, and we have to start to walk in that excellence, talk in that excellence, but importantly, we have to act in that excellence. And as I said, we have to act in that excellence because we do a lot of walking and talking in the Caribbean. We're good at that. We have now to act in that excellence in all the ways that we that we can do. Now, so that is our new politics. So when I talk about new politics, this is this, this is the, the, the sort of stuff that I'm talking about. It's not just an abstract concept, it's something that you want to translate into real engagement and providing solutions for for, for that for that real engagement. In the Caribbean, we're struggling um, in some of our spaces with the cultural crisis. In the last week, um, I've made interventions, the parties have been making interventions in terms of how we can go about solving and pushing uh, and addressing that crisis. Um, and we can discuss that more at, at, in, in part of the conversations as we go through this evening. Suffice to say, one of the things that we are recommending is that the government brings forward the current reverse tax credit that persons get in the Caribbean who earn below $25,000 a year. That's £7,000 a year, if you roughly, when you calculate. So I want you to imagine that there are persons in Barbados whose yearly salary is £7,000 a year. Now imagine trying to live on seven thousand pounds for a year. So I when, when I say they're persons, I am talking about roughly 44, 45,000 people, according to labor statistics. We have a workforce of about 110,000 people. So that's not that's not just a random slither of, of our workforce. That is a broad amount of persons. Who are working for that twenty-five thousand Barbados dollars a year? Currently, they can get a tax credit. You guys are familiar with the reverse tax credit. You have your own system here of uh, one thousand three hundred dollars. We have argued that the government, because of uh, rising prices, is collecting more revenue than it would have uh, estimated or budgeted for, and therefore, in order to help provide an ease for persons, it should bring forward what these people will normally get to the now. That is why I'm talking about the now. You know, you can be ready for the future, but people need assistance now. There is, there is nothing more daunting than putting off that, that will put off the future if you can't feed your families. If you can't take care of your loved ones, what future can you imagine? So in order to be ready for the future, you have to get governments that recognize that you have to care about the people in the now. There is nothing that kills the future like poverty. There is nothing that kills the future like hungry, hunger. And there is nothing that kills the future like lack of opportunities. You, you can't imagine a future if, you, if you're struggling every single day just to get by. How do, you, how do you see where your family is going to be? How do you take your, 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 your kids to the next level? How do you start to generate? And, I, and this is a theme that I'm on as well, generational wealth. And that is something we have to get serious about in the region and in the diaspora. How does the diaspora help us to contribute to generational wealth? So, so we have to move beyond remittances because remittances is something that's just to sustain daily living. That does not prepare for the future. The, to, to, to be ready for the future, now we're talking about generational wealth. We're talking about investments and angel investments in small businesses. Are there opportunities, or does the, 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 the diaspora feel that there are opportunities enough for them to say, you know what, I, I've seen a really innovative business in Barbados. I can get 10 of my friends here. We'll all put in 100 pounds and we'll, we, we can contribute some investment to that uh, every quarter or every, every half year to help it to grow. And, and, and we can see where our investment is going. Are there opportunities for that? And, you know, those are the types of conversations that we have to start. 
Those are the type of things that we have to start thinking about. As I said, we have to start believing and thinking big outside of ourselves and understand that we're dealing with a civilization. We're not just these random pockets of islands of people. We are a Caribbean civilization. And it is time that we bring that civilization to bear on the problems that we face and provide solutions for them and to have you as a diaspora as a real part of, of, of that solution base. I, I want to end there because I really want the interaction. I want to open it up so that you can ask any questions that you want, questions from those online, engagement. So, you know, as I said, part of my new politics is engaging, listening, and then trying to act upon the things. Because it's not just about having these meetings and then I go away and say, brilliant idea, and then we don't do anything about it. Because I also have to be your advocate. I will be your advocate in the spaces that you need me to be your advocate in. And in turn, you can be my advocate in the spaces that I need you to be my advocate in. So it's that, it's that, it's that two-way relationship. It's that relationship where we're, we're meeting now as equals and as colleagues and friends, as DLP friends, as Barbadian friends, as Caribbean friends, to bring our ideas and our views to solve the problems that the region is facing in the now. Because we have to deal with this now so that we can be ready for the future. Because if we lose our young people, if we lose our space to climate change, if we are, are bearing on the burden of debt, there will be no, there will be no future. But we have to believe in ourselves that there can be a future. The future for the Caribbean is bright. I believe genuinely the future for Barbados Best days are ahead of us. It has to be ahead of us. And we have to think that way. I know right now everything seems like it's spiraling out of control. It's the war, it's the, it's the uh, cost of living crisis, global inflation. If it's not COVID, it's monkeypox. There always seems to be something coming at us. But we have to believe that there are brighter days ahead because that is where the future is made. The future is made in that belief. And it's that belief and that strength that we can solve these things. We may not solve all of them now, but we can solve some of them. And when we have the ability to do it, we should do it. That is the argument that we have to put to our governments. Governments are there to do good. They are there to help solve problems and not allow folks to walk alone. And I commit that the Democratic Republican Party will do all it can to ensure that Barbados at the moment, Barbie is here, that you do not walk on. So, on that note, I just open it up to, to any questions or contributions. I think that's a very interesting new concept in new politics. And I, I think that um, you've done well in setting out those themes. And I'm sure that um, there could be a few questions coming up from those on the floor. Uh, so first of all, thank you for that um, address, uh, which I think is very informative. And we start off with, I think, um, Herbert, you've got your hands up. Yes, sir. I like your What I would like to ask of you, you are our new president. Can you hear me with the phone then? I think you hear me, but my voice is bigger. Okay, sorry. Yes. You are our new president. You've listed a lot of things that I am very keen on. But as our new president, you first have the task of rebuilding the DLP. And on that question, I would ask you, how do you see the vision of Barbados through your own eyes in five years' time? You're throwing a hard call there. Um, but, but I'll tell you the reason why I ask you this. <laughs> I'm probably the oldest guy in the audience this evening. <laughs> and I've dealt with lots of former prime ministers. Mm -hmm. I was a member of the DLP from the age of 12. Mm -hmm. 
I'll tell you the story another time. Mm -hmm. But I've always asked former prime ministers, how do you see Barbados in 10 years' time? It is always important to have that vision as you highlighted some of your uh, plan for the future. So, so how do I see Barbados in 10 years' time? And I'm, and I'm glad that you, that you picked up on the, um, on the theme of the new politics, because a big part of how I see Barbados in 10 years' time is, is this idea of new politics, this idea that we have to start creating opportunities uh, for our people in order to be able to generate wealth. So, so, so part of it is changing the way that we understand and we see government. So it has to be about handouts and not handouts. So, so and in order to do that, when you so so this thing about this way, when we start to think about the systems in that way, then we have to change the way we respond to people. So if you if you're saying I'm here to give you a hand up and not a handout, therefore the concept of welfareism has to change. So we have to start thinking: How do you get people uh, who may be in abject poverty? Uh, for example, I realized that about 30% of Barbadians, by some estimates, uh, live in uh, what we call multidimensional poverty. So there are these new ways to measure poverty. It's not just about income, it's about your education. It's about access and opportunities. That's why I keep using on this day about opportunities. Because sometimes in order for, for, to create the chances for people to do better in their lives, you have to create opportunities for them. So if you're talking about new politics and where you see in 10 years, I, five, five, five. I want, I would like to see, and you know, we're not the government at the moment, but I would like to see our welfare system reborn. I want to see, for example, there be clear chances to move people from where they are to another place. Before the election, we had discussions in the party presented to the public about universal basic income. That was one of the things we were looking at and trying to discuss because we recognize that our current welfare system is not working. It, it, it does not allow people the chance to manage their affairs. And what we have is a very dependent type of politics between politicians and persons, and we need to break that cycle. So nobody should be going to a politician to ask for gas or to have their like, bill paid or to buy their truck. There's an indignity in that, and that needs to stop because the systems should be able to provide when you do not have enough to meet your needs. You should not then be behold, uh, you know, be held to an individual for, for what you need to sustain yourself. When you have an entire country that, that models and prides itself on having a, uh, a healthy, uh, welfare and social support system. That's one of the things that I that I see in five minutes. I would love to see. The other thing is our education. Education reform is important. Uh, that is something that I would like to see. And I would like to see opportunities created. Right now we have a system where we know that I think it's about a third is majesty coming up. And it's probably the same third by poverty. Who do not do well in our system? The 11 plus fails these kids. So you go, you go to school, you know, you're in level plus, you get 30%, 40%, 50%, whatever the situation, and you have a whole system that's indenting you to say that you are not right, you are no good, you cannot do well. That is wrong. That is not to take away from the fact that their kids will get 190, 80, but a good system takes care of the others who may not be getting 80, 90, and 100. And you have to find a way to ensure that they can reach their potential. And the way our system measures education, it is typically on mass and English. There's so many other skills in our world, so many other forms of knowledge um, and, 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 and areas of expertise beyond mass and English. How do we capture and measure those kids who have contributions to make, whether it's in IT and arts and creations and drama and literature? And we are not doing this. We literally have created a system that discards. Literally at 11, you're discarded. The system says you are no more. And then you're surprised if you take the measures, the, the, the folks who are maybe uh, in terms of 
who are living in poverty, then you create a system which tells them, okay, you're no good. So you're discarded by the education system. And then those same folk end up incarcerated. And then you wonder why? It, it is obvious, but we're not breaking the links at any of the spaces. And it's more expensive to spend money on incarcerating people. We know this all over the world than fixing education or actually, you know, providing uh, income to help them move themselves from poverty. So you would have folks going like, you know, if you provide a uh, basic income to persons, you're giving them free money and you're encouraging these. This the answer is no, because if you don't spend the money at the beginning, you're going to spend it at the end and it's going to be more. So you have a country, as a country, you decide where your priorities are. Are you going to lock up people or are you going to provide opportunities for them? I know what type of country that I want to be in. I want to be the one that provides opportunities and says, you know what, jail and incarceration is a real, real, real last resort because that's not where we want to be. So we're going to invest in our people. We're going to invest in education. We're going to invest in ensuring that they have opportunities to make the best of themselves. Because we like to brag about how great the education system in Barbados is. How great can the education system be when you're discarding thousands of young people every single year? You are literally telling them you will not succeed. And we feel proud about that. That's nothing to be proud about. That's something to be fixed and fixed head on to make Barbados better, to get the best out of every single resource that we're invested. This single individual deserves a chance to be the best of themselves. That's one of the things that I would like to see. On the economic front, I would like to see next five years that we diversify, you know, we talk about this, I hate even using that word, diversifying our economy, because the economy is tourism dependent. I'm not saying that you get rid of tourism because we know the reality is it is one of our major industries, but we have to start thinking, what else can Barbados do to attract wealth and not only attract it, but attract the technology and experiences behind that wealth to sustain the life that we want in our country? And those are the kind of conversations that we have. I've pitched and I've talked about creating service zones to attract new businesses, to attract new investments, creating the appropriate infrastructure for them. There are ideas up there. It is not like there's no, they're, they're, that we're born with ideas, as I said before. We're an intelligent enough people. When I say people, I mean all of us, this collective Caribbean civilization, that we can bring our own solutions to bear on our problems. So when I think of Barbados in the next five years, I see a country where the people are at the center of this country, where people become first. They are the priority of the government. And it's that the job and the role of government to provide opportunities and provide solutions to their pressing needs in the now. Because if we do not, that ready for the future that, 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 that I'm talking about, this vision for this country that is excelling and doing well, and people are happy to live in this country, will not exist. But we can do it. I know we can do it if we bring our collective wills to bear on that. Recently, for example, we did some research, part commission some research, and we recognized that more than half, if not of folks, think the government's not doing well and handling the uh, inflation crisis as well. So then, as a government, you hear that the question is not to bury your head, head in the sand, and you know one of the ministers comes out and says, you know, we're doing everything we can, but you're not. If we, the people, are telling you you're handling this poorly. Your response should be, okay, I understand, we've heard you, we're going to come back to you with some solutions. We've put our solutions on the table, now you need to tell us why this can't work. And if they can't work, you need to explain to us then, what is the alternative that the government is willing to assist people in the now in this cost of living crisis? Because we need to assist them in the now to get to the future that, that, you, want, that you want to see, that I want to see. Because we can't leave them by the wayside now. Yes, Mr. President, thanks for that for your answer, for your vision of all this in policy. And I would assume that is rebuilding of our future. Ready for government. Oh, I like the way you're going for ready for the future, ready for government. We <laughs> can only talk about the future. <laughs> I, I, but, yeah, I like the way that you're, I love the way that you're saying this, but you know, we're building our parties, obviously. 
a big part of what we have to do here. Um, and the Democratic Labour Party is a key institution in Barbados. It is a key institution in the Caribbean. We have been at the center of the founding of the Caribbean, modern Caribbean, if you like. Um, you know, our founder, Alvaro, was, was preeminent in Caricom. We created, we were there at the creation of these vehicles to bring the Caribbean together. So the party has a rich tradition and a legacy. And I said it uh, when I was installed as president. Uh, we need to use and go back to some of those first principles, but build and modernize the party to respond to the change in the environment. And part of that response is to recognize that everyone is welcome in this big tent. Everyone is welcome in the big tent of the Democratic Labour Party. We want you, we want your skills, we want your talents, we want your ideas. So when I talk about collectivity, it runs through everything that I'm thinking about. This idea of collective humanity, collective civilization is not just for the Caribbean. I even see it again, it's the big tent. Everybody needs to come into this tent so that we can that we can excel and we can do the best. We can't leave people outside. No one should be left behind. I know we make these big pronouncements and it's difficult to imagine everybody having a chance, but we have to pitch there so that at the least that oh, everyone can have that chance. If you start up with the view that, you know, we're gonna leave, we can't cover everybody, so we're gonna leave some behind. No, 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 then you end up leaving more. If you start with the view, everybody is welcome in this tent because this is the space that we want to use to start to build up the new barbers. It has to start from somewhere. And, you know, often, I've said this before, people rubbish politics, they rubbish political parties, you know, I don't want to get involved. I don't like politics. I don't like politicians. I understand. I, I so understand where you are. But at the same point, if you want to change the things around you that you want, that you that you want to fight for, and the things that are important to you, you need to be involved in politics. I'm not saying run for office, that, that's not where the space is for everybody, but you have to have that seat at the table so that you're influencing the decisions and the things that matter to you. And the Democratic Labour Party is a key part of the Barbadian uh, uh, political and economic social fabric. And there is a key part of the Caribbean social and political fabric. And therefore, a key part of the Caribbean civilization. This, this party, you know, let, let's start to think big about who we are. Let's not, not downsize ourselves. Let's outsize ourselves. This party has been key to the founding of the idea of Caribbeanism in its modern form. Alvaro was there before people were, like, you know, on the idea of going to Cuba, recognizing Cuba as, as a space. Who was there in the 70s? Before, before all of these things, before you had advocates up there um, for the Caribbean, uh, in terms of uh, you know fighting for 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 the Caribbean in different spaces in the U.S. in the U.K. you know he was there. We and this party has been key, you know this party has been key to 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 Caribbeanism, and we need to to recognize that, and we need to embrace it and remember that, and use that as a base to build on who we are. They said, don't downsize ourselves. Let us outsize ourselves in every single way that we can. Thank you, Mr. President. I now the others who want to ask. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the sponsor. Um, let me come to you. Uh, thank you. And, and thank you for a really um, interesting and uh, I found it quite impressive as your speech. I really enjoyed that. And, and I want to say thank you for, for delivering it here in Battersea as well. I, I see this as a, as a, as a cultural center, so I'm glad, I'm glad that you, um, you come here for that. Um, I just wanted to ask though, um, I was really interested in the stuff you were saying. Um, oh, I want to point out one thing. I know you were celebrating the, the first mayor of, of, of Leicester, and that's great. Just want to say here in Battersea, John Archer, who was the, the, the son of, 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 a, of a Barbadian guy um, was 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 mayor a hundred years ago. So 
just, just just say how great we are here in Battersea. <laughs> but but um <laughs> <laughs> But, but I, wanted, I wanted to just, just a tiny bit on, you talked about um, opportunity and, and what maybe the diaspora, and that even though I'm not Asian, I, you know, I'm, I consider that as a, as a, I consider that as black people basically worldwide. Um, what we can be doing to help over there, it, to be honest, a lot of the stuff you said is more about how we can get representation and having space in, in the parliament there. I, I want to hear more about what we should be doing. What, should, what can we be doing? Other than money, obviously, what can we be doing to change the global system? Maybe I'm thinking about reparations, maybe I'm thinking about trade, maybe I'm about these sorts of things. How, how, can we, how can we be more linked with our, our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean? What should we be doing? Okay, yeah, so, so that's a right, good question. Um, and in part, it goes back to, to what I was saying in terms of the, the advocates, the diaspora here, these are the advocates for the issues that we're facing. Um, but you can only be advocates if you're fully informed of what you're advocating for. And that's why I said that the, the, the space of having you as part of our of our systems. I don't you know, as I said, we just think about it carefully. We need to sit down with our collective minds to bear and decide what it's going to look like. That is important because that informs you of what you're representing over here. So, so when you speak to your local councillor, you've got in this room, you've got him here now. We've got two local councillors. <laughs> when we speak to our local councillors, they know that we in the Caribbean, we want better trade. They know that we want better access to, for our goods here. So when these local councillors sit in their council meetings or they write to their MPs, they will say, dear Mr. MP, I have had representations from the diaspora, from my Barbadian brothers and sisters, Jamaican, whatever, for these issues. I want you to stand up in parliament. I want you to make this an issue in your party. Whether it's the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, uh, Lib Dems, I want to hear these voices and these issues represented because you need to recognize that we are an important voting constituency and a voting block here. So it's about being organized. Again, it's that collectiveness to recognize that you are an important block to, for, 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 for folks winning uh, elections here. And that collective power has to be brought to bear for us in the Caribbean. Because our voices need to be amplified uh, as part of this collective diaspora. Because when we talk about the Caribbean, we're not, we often, we're not just thinking of those spaces in the Caribbean, the physical spaces there. The Caribbean is a, is a concept that embraces all of us, whether we are physically there or whether we're not. And we need to start to own that. Sometimes we like to make that division that, you know, it, it, it's about the, the folks at home, and then there's this division for the folks abroad. But we have to recognize that the reality is the world will treat us all the same. You are from the Caribbean. It doesn't matter if you're living there or you're not living there. Some of these systems respond to you in the same way. So, so your advocacy for those spaces there is also advocacy for you here. And that's some of the ways that, that, that you can help us. Find out what issues are. You know, I, I, I can list you chapter and verse of what the things that we're facing that we need you to help us fight on. And how to fight and bring those issues to bear on the political system here. Because we are an important part of the UK. We're an important part of the world. And that needs to be recognized. We need to stop seeing ourselves as small and downsizing. It is time to walk into our space, walk into our civilization, because we are. We hear about all of these civilizations, Indian civilization, African civilization, this body is a civilization. We are a civilization. We're not just a random set of people who happen to, to come upon a, a, a slave ship and happen to be in Barbados and happen to be in Jamaica. We are a people in the fullest of the sense. History, art, poetry, 
um, drama, theater, science, everything that you can think about that can define a people, we are that. And it is time that we own it. It is time that our political institutions start to mature and respond to us as a people. There are those institutions are in the Caribbean, whether that's the Democratic Labour Party, for instance, or whether it's the local parties here in the UK, Labour, Conservatives, we're not just these random plots of sand for, for, for tourism and for a good time and for a run but fine, but we are a people, we are a serious civilization which has made contributions to mankind. If you take away some of the Caribbean's contributions, the world is poor for it. Remove lambing from the world. What do you have? Remove all of them, Sobers, all of them, Rihanna, all of them. Just, just start taking away all the Caribbean people, anyone with the Caribbean connection. The world is poor for it. Surgeons, doctors, we're not just talking entertainers, because often some things that's when we feel that no, there are brilliant minds in the Caribbean that have made this world. And we need to recognize and walk into our space. Own it. When I say we're ready for the future, it is time. We've talked about it. We've had the movements of the 60s to independence. We're now moving towards republicanism. Admittedly, it wasn't done the way that I would have done it, but we're here. Now it is time to make good on those promises to ourselves. Realize what I said. We're making good on those promises for anybody else now. To ourselves and to who we are as a people. It is time. Thank you very much. Next question. And I've got a message online as well. I've got a message online. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for that very impassioned um, and very um, inspiring speech. Um, as an educator, I was going to ask you about education, <laughs> but you've more or less, um, you more or less covered that for me in terms of, the, you know, the ideas, you know, you're thinking of, about inclusivity when yes. it comes to uh, the, the, the children, uh, not sort of creaming off the top there as, yeah. as, um, as happens now. So I'm going to ask you about political engagement. I know that the numbers were down in terms of voting and say the last election or the last couple of elections. Mm -hmm. So people seem to have lost that sort of enthusiasm for, uh, for politics. So I was wondering what mechanisms do you have in place to sort of engage people again so that they'll become more interested in politics and for example, go out and vote. Okay. Um, that, that, that's, a, that's an interesting one. The reason I say that um, is that Anderson and I, on the way here, we're, we were we actually having the same conversation. Um, so I'll, I'll start by saying a lot of our modern politics, and it's something that we all have to recognize as parties, as individuals, the consulates here would probably back me up on this. A lot of our modern politics is now based on single politics issues. So people you know, get their placard, they do their march, they advocate, they get petitions, and often it's for something, you know, save this or fight for this, but they're often these single, single politics issues. So, so when people, for example, say young people are not involved in politics, that's not true. They are involved in politics, just not the way that the older folks would. So in terms of the older folks, it was in terms of a uh, friend who covered everything. So you, you got involved because you wanted to, to bring a uh, force to bear on the entire political system to, to adjust to respond to whatever needs you have, whether it's housing, crime, education, welfare, uh, ledger, whatever your needs were. Now, a lot of young people you find, their engagement is in one particular political issue. Recognizing that, then what you have to do, you have to start to speak to their issues. And even if you're drawing them in to the political space on their issue, once you have them as a captive audience, then you have to think, what other things can I get them involved in? How can I move them from just 
save whatever, save example, or save this, or do this, or, um, you know, uh, protein against animals, veganism, uh, climate change, um, better voting, low credit, whatever the particular issues are. How can I then take that and translate it into a, into having them understand, and not only understand, but providing opportunities and mentoring, because a lot of it will come up to that, that they recognize, you know what, I want to be a counselor. Because being a counselor, I have a seat at the table that I will not only be able to affect the single issue that I was trying to fight for, but I can actually start to affect all of the other issues around it that may be shaping that single issue. So that, that is one way that we have to, to look at. And the other thing is simply meeting people where they are. So it's literally coming up to, to see you. This is it, meeting people where they are and trying to understand really what they are going through in their space. What is hurting them? And then how can I provide or advocate and combat the advocacy? Because sometimes as a, a opposition party, we, we actually can't do anything until we have our hand. How can I be an advocate for the thing that you need? So how can I be an advocate for solutions to cost of living to help those people in Barbados who are really, really, really hurting? And, and who needs somebody that says, I care about you. I understand you're hurting and I will be your advocate. I will be there to advocate for your issue. So, so those are two things. One, once you brought your people in on the same issues, extend, try to extend to the other issues and have them recognize the value and the power of having that seat at the table. And also two, providing a space and a seat at the table for them to want to come to. And the third thing, meeting people where they are in their spaces, meeting them where they are and bringing them along with you whatever vision, whatever dream, whatever you are, are, are trying to do for the good of your country and for them, so they understand that you care about them. And I, and I hope that folks listening home, folks listening here, would understand when I talk about new politics, that is what I'm talking about. Having people, having you at the center of everything I do, every decision has to be about how does this make life better for our Barbadians, for Caribbean folk? How can we improve their life? Because that's essentially what a government has to be. A government has to be for good. There has to be good government for a good people and to create that good society that we all want to live in. Nobody, everybody wants to live in good society. The thing is, how do we go about creating it? And first start is that we engage with people. We understand that your key elements are the society and, 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 and we don't treat you as numbers or economic figures or, you know, you, you think, oh, if we move 1%. Now, if, if you put a 1% tax raise, that's affecting somebody. That's somebody's money. That's less bread. That's less cheese. That's less milk. They may have like it. These are real things. You just can't say, oh, it's just a 1% tax. You know, we have situations in the government had a 1% tax on, uh, recently in Barbados for, for the middle class claiming to recoup our cost of COVID. But I think there was a, there was a missed opportunity to understand, yeah, it sounds like a small amount, but that's somebody's small amount. That's somebody's budget you've interfered with because you just see it as a number, but there's a human being, there's somebody behind that. Mary, Pat, Jane, Jim, Jock, somebody will be hurting because of what you did. And then you have to decide what are your priorities as a government to avoid and create the less hurt. Every policy that a government does, you should have literally be on the side. How many people will lose? And if that policy has more losers than winners, that policy is a no -no. It has to be. It cannot, you cannot create policies that will have more losers on the losing side than on the winning side. And that's how governments need to have to start thinking. It's not just a 1% or 2%. There are people behind those numbers.
We've got some questions coming in online as well. I've got a comment from uh, Maxine McLean. Mm -hmm. um, she says, she said, beyond advocacy, I believe that in Barbados and across the diaspora, UK, USA, etc. There is tremendous intellectual capital, which can, from the basis of offering significant professional services across the global, uh, global across the global, Africa, South and Central America, and the EU, etc. And I also have a question from Judy Eversley. And she says, thank you, Mr. President. What are your plans for getting the party unified? Okay, um, so to, to Maxine's question, she's very much right. Uh, and I think I, I, I hinted at it, but I'm glad that the question brought a little more directly. So yes, it's not about advocacy, but as I said, it's a way of that intellectual capital to bear on, on, our, on our collective problems. Um, that's why I said we, we have to recognize when we are solving and we're thinking of the problems that we face in the Caribbean, that there's knowledge, you know, rich, rich, rich knowledge that can help us. And we need to start leaning in on that a little bit more. And that's why, that's why I've said, and this is probably the second time uh, during this whole, this whole time of trip I've been here, I've talked about recalibrating the relationship between diaspora uh, and, and, and local. As I said, we have to start recognizing ourselves as one collective uh, set of people, whether you live uh, in the actual physical space in Barbados or in the Caribbean, or you, or you live here. You're still part of that same, same collective and bring that to bear. Now, in terms of the second question um, on um, part unity, I spoke about this at the inauguration. Um, and, and I would say the part needs united. You know, parties are big tents. I've talked about this. Parties are big tents. Think, think about it. Think about all the different people, views that make up the richness that is the Democratic Labour Party. Think about all of those voices, all of those uh, different folks, men, women, Indians, Blacks, uh, folks, uh, who live in 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 in, um, in Barbados? Folks who will live here, uh, you know. Think of all these people bringing their time, their intellectual capital to bear on the party. Parties are big tents, and within that tent, the views sometimes folks will not agree because they're coming from different positions. Someone will see something that way, someone will see something that way. And that's fine. That is not disunity. That is richness of discussion. That is a tradition that is within this party. Folks have independent minds, voices, and they want to bring that to bear in the party. My job as president is to take all of those views and ideas, amalgamate them, and create something, a force, that the party can use. That is my job. That that that's the role of leader. That you know, my my job is not to uh, shut those voices down, but to bring them together in harmony. It's a little bit like a, uh, a conductor for an orchestra. You're gonna have the band. You're gonna have the drums one go where we allow. The triangle is ding. Then you have you know you have the then you have the flute. You <laughs> might have the violins are really really soft, and you have all of these instruments. Then you've got, you know, you have the, the, the front singer, then you've got the backup singers, and somehow the job of the conductor is to create harmony from all of that. Realize the conductor does not stop anyone from exhibiting their talents and their skills. He does not say, you triangle, you're too quiet. You, Mr. Drum and Bass, you too loud. He does not say, you, uh, front singer, I'm trying to be front. You, backup singer, what you said, he does not say that. He meets every single one of them, where? In their space. When I talk about new politics, I am serious. The point is to meet people in their spaces, 
My job as marketing leader is to create that harmony. Not to stop the singing, not to stop the music, but somehow my magical job is to get everyone in the same beat so that we get a song that is beautiful. Has anyone got any other questions on the floor? Hi, my name is Chini. I've okay. always lived in London. I've lived a number of years back in Barbados. Um, however, I have a slightly different um, perspective on, say, the rebuilding of the, of the party. Mm -hmm. I'm starting there rather than where I was going to start, mm -hmm. in that I'm also a musician, so mm -hmm. I know that you have to have the same score. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to play from the same score. Mm -hmm. You know, the old term of singing from the same hymn sheet. I'm not yeah. going to use that one. <laughs> but every instrument has its own score, mm -hmm. but it has to come together. Right. Now, the, I believe that the job of the president is to use the score, which has perhaps been written by somebody other than himself, mm -hmm. but to keep the party in tune together mm -hmm. sometimes the triangle might be the loud one mm -hmm. sometimes the drum might be the loud one but the point is that when you finish the whole piece of music that it's harmonious mm -hmm. now i have been a, an advocate of process and procedure mm -hmm. for a long time mm -hmm. whatever i worked in before i retired so i am very interested in what process and procedure the the party is going to use actually on the ground to get people to even come out and vote, mm -hmm. people to be politically aware of what's going on, how to interpret what's going on around them, how to speak about what they're hurting on. Even if you have young people who are interested in one issue, how do you get someone, how do you get them to share that issue and to make it harmonious throughout the party. I grew up understanding the fundamental difference between the two major parties in Barbados. The Democratic Labour Party has always encouraged me to be able to sit at the table with the opportunity, sitting there and being able to share, rather than sitting around, sitting at the table rather than around the table and, and waiting for someone to hand me a crumb off of the main table. Now, that's something that I've taught my children and I teach anybody who will, wants to know what the fundamental difference is. Simple thing, either sit at the table up front or you sit around the table and take the crumbs or when I choose to hand you. So I want to know what is the strategy mm -hmm. of the party to be able to use ideas from the diaspora, mm -hmm. from locally, and um, I have to challenge you separately about the Caribbean culture because um, I think if you understand what happens right here in England, in that we hear about one country particularly, and everybody will ask you if you're from that country. So Barbadians have to be as proud as and push Barbados and what we can do to make things better, either here, or in Barbados, just like how Calmarians talk about Calmare and everybody hasn't been to Calmare, but you know that when a Calmarian is around, everybody has to know you went to Calmare. So we need to instill in DLP supporters the same sort of proud um, Barbadianism here in England or among yourselves that we can build. So that's a process and a procedure that we need to have in place so that using your orchestra, everybody manages that piece of music according to what's written for them. Thank you. Right, thank you. I, I think I think you you in some ways you answered the question quite excellently. I love it. I love the pose and answer um, answer question. The the and I and I will say this, I made a commitment not to have a running commentary on the party strategy in public. And I will stand by that. Yes. Strategic issues and things we can we can discuss offline. Um, but 
a lot of the engagement that you're talking about is, is, is just things like this. It is going back into the community. Um, it is things that we know that we have to do. We have to go back and make ourselves felt present. We've talked about this before in the public. As I said, I will not necessarily get into strategic detail, blow by blow discussions. I think the party has to go beyond that. We are beyond that. Um, and I, I, I feel that we are turning over um, a new leaf. We are, we are a proud institution and a proud tradition. And I am, I am so, so, so happy um, to see folks um, recommitted. Not, not, so I use the word re because they were already committed, but recommitting to this this new phase um, and this new energy that we are, we, are, we are bringing to the party, whether it's here, whether it's there, but to recognize also that we are one party. We really, one Barbados, we really need all of our, all of our, all of our talents and all of our hands on there. I think we have to take one more, and then we have also time to turn on. I'm afraid we have to take one last question. Um, yeah, we have a question from Councillor Anon. Thank you very much for your statement. For your statement, yeah, it's very impressive. Um, the question I wanted to ask you is: You stated from your statement, uh, which you did earlier on, that in Barbados, the, I'm not, I'm not from Barbados. I'm a Ghanaian from Africa, and we are all one people. All from Africa, yeah. You, you stated that there are lots of guys. Yes, yeah. you stated that the lot of black and all poor people in Barbados just like in Ghana as well. Mm -hmm. And it's it's time that we have to stop this thing has to stop where by uh, people have to follow politicians for their electric bill and gas bill and all that. Everybody has to get a shake from the table. And um, as the leader of the position party, if by chance, by grace, tomorrow, or maybe by next week, something should happen for you to be elected as a sitting president. What will be your what would be the first most priority thing you would do to change that situation? <laughs> One, all I can tell you, my sister, <laughs> my sister, speak it into being. I, li I like that. If you were elected, I like it. Speak it into being. I think one of the first things that I would do, I would have to implement some form of basic income so that folks have direct access to resources that they can live and lift themselves out of poverty and live a dignified life that does not require them to be beggars at the feet of political institutions or politicians. I know that sounds crazy because as a politician, you think you want to you want to keep people um, beholden to you, but no. I I think part of my new politics is not only opportunities, it has to be empowerment. And the only way, and one of the ways that you can empower people is if they can want, they can see the future, they can start dreaming about the future. And if they have the ability even if they are poor or they live in poverty, in a dignified way to move themselves from one point to another by not having to beg someone for something. Because we have to start treating our people and treating to them in that way. So I think some form of basic income and, and serious welfare reform to, to, allow, to allow, sometimes what, I, what you can even think about is the working poor. Because, you know, if, as I said, if you're working for £7,000 a year, you are the working poor. How do you provide for those thousands and raise the numbers that I call, I don't have a few hundred thousand.